Well, amen. It's a joy to be with you. I'm very gr grateful to be in this cave. I'm echoing, aren't I? Just a little bit. You got me? All right, man. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, it's a joy to be with you. It's been, uh, I think you've been in this building 20 years. Am I right? First revival you ever had here in this church, I preached it. Uh, under the uh, ministry and uh, pastor of Herschel Crane, who was my father in the ministry. I love Brother Herschel Crane. Amen. I preached one time in the church there on the Mill Hill. God gave me that privilege, and then he done this miracle work here. A tremendous uh, what God has done here and sitting right between the, right, right there, right here in the corner, right here where everybody comes by and sees this beautiful church. And, and I just praise the Lord for it and thank the Lord for what he's done here through the years. And, and uh, I miss my dear pastor. I loved him very much. And I know God uh, did a work uh, through him here. There's no doubt about that. And I praise the Lord for that. And then I preached one other time, right before, not long before he retired. I preached here in the church and I hadn't been back since. I thought, man, they told me something. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Ha -ha. But anyway, anyway, it is a joy to be back and to be here with you. Appreciate you, Pastor, and the good work God's doing through you here at this church and, and the way this church is going forward for the glory of God. It is a shining light, and I praise the Lord for that. I tell you, I had all my notes just laid out here in my, all my, uh, in my uh, notebook here and I've got probably about five or six sermons. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? I got five or six sermons. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And so I went to Isaiah, and he said, no. I went to another place in Isaiah. He said, no. I went to 2 Corinthians chapter 26, and he said, no. And I said, well, you got to tell me something. I got to preach here in just a minute, amen? These guys done such a good job singing, and I don't want to ruin it, amen? But I tell you the truth, the Bible tells us in Luke's gospel, the Bible tells us in Luke's gospel, if you'll look there with me, in Luke's gospel chapter 13 and verse 11. Luke's gospel chapter 13 and verse 11, and we will stand here in just a moment in reverence of the reading of the precious word of God. Uh, if you have that chapter and that verse, Luke 13, verse 11, would you stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's precious word? The Bible says there in verse 11, it says, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed uh, together. Now that word bowed there means that she was bent over means that she was as if someone was bowing down to a king. She was, she was bent over. And listen, listen what it says. She was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. You got to notice, folks, that he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thy infirmities. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which man ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to, to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, that's important, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loose from the bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things 
that, that were done by him. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that it will never return void. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help me preach it as you would have me to preach tonight for your glory, your honor, and your praise. Lord, we're nothing. You're everything. You must increase. We must decrease. Oh, God, help us tonight to honor you. And, Lord, as you speak, speak in a mighty way to all of us, not just some of us, but all of us. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Right here in the Word of God we see in Luke 13, 11 through 17, we have the inspired record of the way in which a poor woman who had a spirit of infirmity came to the Lord and was set completely free, was set completely free by the Lord Jesus. Now listen to me. For 18 years, she had known nothing but misery. Nothing but misery, nothing but defeat, nothing but frustration. 18 years of her life, she was bent over. 18 years of her life, she could do nothing for herself. And right here in these verses, as you will note, this, this lady, this dear lady, the Bible says was in church. This lady was, uh, was a daughter of Abraham. She had a relationship. She had fellowship, but her fellowship was hindered because of her situation. She was defeated. She was distressed. She was in despair. She was broken. She had no help and she had no way until that morning Jesus showed up. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning, I mean tonight, and I want you to hear me well. Jesus said in these verses of Scripture, as I share with you, Jesus looked at that woman and he said, don't you think it's about time? Don't you think it's about time that you listen to me? Don't you think it's about time that you accept my invitation? Don't you think it's about time that you realize that you can't do it on your own? You need my help. You need to listen to me. I'm telling you tonight, family, listen to me. Every last one of us in here has a problem. And if you can't find one, just get a mirror out and look at yourself. Because the biggest problem you got is you. That's my problem. That's my problem. The biggest problem to me is tie. It's not somebody on the front row, the second row, or the third row. It's not my wife, even though I won't tell her that. But I want you to know that I, that, that, that I am my biggest problem. When I look in the mirror, I see me. I'm going to help you all this week. This means yes. This means no. Amen. But I want you to understand that that's exactly right. When I look in that mirror, I see me. There's nobody else standing there but me. And if I'm ever going to be right with the Lord Jesus, then old Ty's got to admit that the biggest problem he has in life is not you but me. I can't lift myself up. I can't help myself. But I want you to know there's somebody in me. There's somebody in me, in the inner man, in my soul, that is complete in me, that is perfect in me, that knows the answer to my life. He knows the greatest need of my life. He knows the greatest need of my heart. And I want to tell you, if anybody can meet it, it's him. It's him. I'm grateful tonight that I can come and challenge you with that. But I'm asking you a question. Don't you think it's about time? Don't you think it's about time to give him your marriage? Don't you think it's about time to give him your sickness? Don't you think it's about time to give him that which is gripping you and you can't get a grip on what's gripping you? Don't you think it's about time to just say, Jesus, I'm going to listen to you. Friend, if we're going to have revival in these days, we got to give him what we got. 
we got to give him what we got, and we've got to quit trying to hold on. And I want to tell you another thing we got to do, too. we got to admit that we've got some things in our life that's got a grip on us. Jesus is in the church here, and he's speaking here. And I want to tell you, he's teaching this woman and others that he can get a grip on what's gripping you. Boy, don't you want that? Don't you want that? Some of you not shaking your head. I just told you every last one of you got a problem. Every last one of you got a problem. You really got a problem when you can't shake your head yet. You got to admit it. You got to admit it. The reason people don't want the aisles anymore is because they are thinking about what somebody else is thinking about them having some kind of issue in their life and they're too full of pride to go down listening to God to do something about it so they can be right with God when he leaves. You see, the people that are judging you for coming down, they don't see who they really are. If God's going to move in these days, we've got to quit looking at people. We've got to quit wondering what somebody's going to think about us. They already think things about you. Just come on down. Amen. Oh, listen to me. Surely it was about time he's telling this woman that you can be set free from the things which have bound you all these years. And this is the personal application of this incident to, to in, in, in our own lives today. See, the Lord says to us, isn't it about time you found deliverance from the things which have bound you and, and defeated you and frustrated you in your life. Many Christians are gripped by what, what uh, 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 have been described as chronic diseases of the soul. Many are defeated and sick because uh, they know the pardon. Listen to me. They know the pardon of the Lord, but they don't know the power of the Lord. Many people know the resurrection. Wrecked, Lord, but they don't know resurrection power. And it's a fact. They don't know that. So that's what the Lord is saying. That's what the Lord is trying to get across here. How many are bound by the sins of the Spirit, such as jealousy, such as pride, such as selfishness, such as doubt, such as fear, such as worry, and some even are bound by the sins of the flesh? Revival will never come to the church house until God's people are willing to admit that they've got issues in their life and only Jesus can help them with that which is keeping them back from being what Jesus wants them to be. And that is a fact. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 10 or 15 years. Can I tell you some folks have been a Christian for 50 years? You can be bound by things in this life, and it holds you back from being what Jesus wants you to be. You can go to church every Sunday. You can go every Sunday night. You can go on Wednesday night. You can go to revival. You can go to good gospel singers. But I want you to understand something. If you're bound by things in your life, you know you're bound by them. You know you're bound by them. You know that those things are holding you back from you being what Jesus wants you to be. And I want to tell you, my dear friend, he's here to help you tonight. He's here to show you some things. One of the greatest things in my life that takes place is when I open myself up to him and he begins to show me who I am in him. You see, it's called dying. There's a man lying in the hospital right now fighting for his life. His name's Wendell Rose. He's a great preacher, pastored Westside Baptist Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina for many years. My first staff position was in 1983 with Dr. Wendell Rose. And I remember that. I, I was in a church running about 100 where God called me, and when I was called to that church, they were running 55 in Sunday school, and and 110 in children's church. And I went over there to be the youth guy. And I want to tell you, I was so green behind the ear. I'm, I'm telling you, I was greener than I am now. I'm still green. Amen? Y'all listening? 
I don't know it all. I hadn't yet attained. I hadn't yet arrived. Amen? Amen. But listen to me. Old Wendell's fighting through his life right now. Saturday night was a week ago. He had a stroke sitting in a restaurant. He's fighting through his life right now. He asked me one time in the car before they voted on me as the youth guy at Westside Baptist Church in Spartanburg. He asked me this question. He said, Ty, I'm going to ask you something, son. Very energetic, man. He said, you ever been broken? I said, about all my life. <laughs> I have been broke all my life. I'm not kidding you. I didn't know what it was to be broken. He said, he said, I said, what is that, preacher? He said, you'll know in time. You'll know in time what it is to be broken, Ty. He said, and when, when that happens, God will change everything about you. And I ought to tell you, as a saved man, young man, saved, on my way to heaven, but I want you to know I was bound. I was bound by selfishness. I was bound by pride. I was bound by arrogance. I was bound by jealousy. So many other things that was in my life that I wasn't willing to give over to him. But I didn't know that. And I'll never forget in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee at a youth conference in the hotel room Wendell walked in and said, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. Will you pray with me? And that day in that hotel room on about the 10th or 11th floor, overlooking Gatlinburg, Tennessee, at the Sheraton, I got to confessing things in my life that I didn't, didn't even know I'd done. I got to asking his forgiveness I wept like a baby, and I want you to know on my knees that day I experienced what it was to be broken before God. And I want to tell you, he cleaned me up on the inside so that I might be what he wants me to be on the outside. And that's not the only time I've been broken. But I want to tell you why brokenness took place in my life. It's because I was truthful to my Lord about me. And that's where revival comes. That's where revival comes. Revival is not supposed to be about just getting together and calling it a revival meeting. Revival is about when you and I get honest about ourselves. We start looking at ourselves. You say, we ought to be preaching for souls. It's a Sunday night. I want to tell you, souls are going to get saved when the children of God get right. That's why we're not seeing any baptisms across Southern Baptist Convention like we used to. And that's why we're watching churches die left and right. It's because children of God are not admitting that they are not right with Jesus. There's three or four things I want you to see. I want you to look with me here. As we talk about, don't you think it's about time? Don't you think it's about time as you take a look at your life and see the good work that he wants to do? It's his power. It's his power. Here's a question. Is his power sufficient? I'll answer that. Yes, it is. Can he break our long-standing habits and set us free so that our lives glorify him? Yes, he can. You see, the incident before us tells us that he can, and in this story, in this truth right here of this woman, we have an illustration of the way in which he does it. Number one, I want you to see the desperate plight of the woman. I want you to see the desperate plight of the woman. It's easy to see what was the true condition of this poor soul. She was deformed. Listen to me. She was defeated, she was depressed, and she was in despair. Notice number one, she was a daughter of Abraham. Now, what does that mean? It means that she was, in, uh, she was also in the synagogue. We are told this in verse 10. The Bible tells us there that, and, and, and uh, the Scripture says there in verse 10, 
and he was teaching uh, in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Look with me at verse 16. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound. The Word of God says here that she was a daughter of Abraham. She was not an irreligious person. She was in church and a daughter of Abraham, and yet she was bound and in desperate need. I'm telling you, most people in the church, they say you're not judge. You judge a preacher, no, I'm preaching. There's a big difference in judging and preaching. And I want you to understand something. Most people in the church today have got something that they're bound by it. They're bound by it. And they won't admit it. These things going on in your life has got you bent over. Nobody else can see that but you and God. And the devil, because the devil's the one that comes in and, 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 and does that to you. You said the devil's a defeated foe. Well, why are you letting him win in your life? Son, you're more than a conqueror through the Lord Jesus. And what we've done is we've let Satan bind us. You see what the Bible says up here? The Bible says, I won't stay on that long because I'm going to come to it, whom Satan had bound. Your flesh is weak. Your soul secure in the Lord Jesus. Man, you're heaven bound. But while you're down here, there's a work to do. And Satan wants to stop you from doing that work. So he'll use something in your past to keep you limited. You with me? He'll use something that you faced in life to keep you limited. He will use it to, to make you feel limitless. He'll do it. Oh, listen to me. There's the desperate plight of the woman. She was the daughter of Abraham. She is therefore a picture of a Christian, of those who have been brought into a special relationship with the Lord who are still in bondage. And for 18 years, 18 years, folks, she had been in bondage. I know couples that have been married more than 18 years that live in bondage every single day of their life. And you ask them if they know Jesus, and they'll tell you they do. They'll tell you that they know they're saved. Am I doubting that? If they tell me they're saved, that's all I've got to go on. If they tell me though they know Jesus, then that's all I've got to go on. You know why? Because I'm a saved, born again, washed in the blood Christian, and if I'm not careful, I'll be bound by the devil. And he loves doing that. You know, he's doing his job. Here's the question, are we doing our job? You see, you're no match for the devil. Are you listening? You're no match for the devil, but the devil's no match for the Jesus that lives in you. You're more than a conqueror. Jesus has made a way where, where there's never been a way. He's made a way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And boy, how grateful I am for that. There's a second thing we see. The Bible says there that she was a daughter of Abraham as we talk about the desperate plight of the woman. Number two, she had a spirit of infirmity. She had a spirit of infirmity. Look at your Bible. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. 18 years and was uh, uh, bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. She was bound and Satan had done this. The Bible says that in verse, in verse 16 to whom Satan had bound 18 years. 18 years. You say, oh, how many of you, how many of you know people today and you've said it before within your own mind uh, your own thinking, you've said, you know what? They've always had issues in their life. I'm going to sit down if y'all don't get honest with me. Huh? They've always had issues. 
They've always had problems. Ever since I've known them, they've had difficulty. Somebody says that about me and you, and say, you don't know what you're talking about. They've always had problems. Can I tell you something, folks? That's people that are bound. That's people that can't lift themselves up. That's people that have problems just like you. And if I'm strong enough in my faith, then I'm going to pray that God is going to touch them. And God's going to do a work in their life like God's done a work in my life. Because if he can do it in me, he can do it in them. You see, he can reach further down than you can ever reach up. That's what he did to me. I was at the bottom. And I couldn't grab hold, but boy, he reached down there to where I was. And I am so thankful. I've been saved, folks, for, for almost 40 years, and I can't get over it. Amen? I can't get over it, man. I'm born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. And he would save somebody like me. And man, when I got saved, Brother Brian, I want you to know, man, that all those things that used to, 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 to bind me, to try to break me, that were breaking me, son, they just tag along all the time, and I got to stay away from them. Amen. I got to stay away from them. I'm going to grab one of these waters. I left mine in the queue. Amen. Y'all want one? We got about three left under here. We can pass it around, get a few crackers, and all of us get right. Amen. <laughs> hey, listen. She had a spirit of infirmity. She did. This also can be true to the Christian. How often we are joyless and how often we are self-centered and bondage to ourself instead of being Christ-centered and occupied with him and who he is. There's a third thing we see. She had been like this for 18 years. We learned this from verse 11. What a tragedy to have been in this condition for so long, 18 years previously. Satan had set upon her, and for all this time, she had been his slave bound by the devil. And I'm telling you folks today, church people sitting in the church are bound by the devil. You say, oh, preacher, boy, I don't know if I like that or not. I don't know if I like that or not. I'm a Christian. I know you are, folks. But the reason you can't let go sometimes, just let God be what he, who he wants to be in your life is because of those things that bind you. That worry. I had a man one time, his mortician, when I passed in Georgia. He'd been a more, he'd been an embalmer, embalmer for 55 years. He knew how to embalm you. And I loved him to death. His name's James Caldwell. Caldwell and his wife Reba, wonderful people. Sharp dresser, had cufflinks. When he died, his wife gave me all his cufflinks because they had C's on them. You know, Childers, all that. <laughs> I'd wear them and do this, you know. Hey, listen. Old James one time was standing with me and he always done his hands. Every time you get with him, his hands be damaged. I said, you know, men, I tell you, they just so much going on. No wonder people's worried to death like they are. He said, I don't worry, preacher. I don't worry about nothing. I said, he's my, one of my members. I said, James, you're lying. He said, no, I'm not. What do you mean by that? I said, because you go around worrying about not worrying. <laughs> Hello? He said, well, Lord God, I ain't never thought about it like that. I said, what about when you left that $4,000 in that man's leg? You 
you, 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 and you embalmed him and you threw his peg leg away. What about that $4,000? You didn't worry then? I said, looks like to me you was worried because you, when you heard and they read the will and said that that $4,000 to bury him was in his peg leg, you went running out with your suit on, worried to death that that money had already been taken off in the trash can. <laughs> he said, I guess I did. <laughs> hey, folks, we worry. I want to tell you, it's a tool of the devil. He uses that against us so much. And we worry about things that ain't even happened yet. Isn't that wonderful? Some of you grinning at me. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you looking at me like a new looking at a new gate. But I want you to know. I want you to know that we worry and we just get full of ourselves, don't we? Don't we? We just get full of pride. And we don't look at other people, man. We just look at what's going on with us. We're not thinking about others. When we pray, we find ourselves praying for somebody, and then all at once we turn it around and praying for ourselves. We we'll pray for people to get saved. Satan don't want you to pray for people to get saved. He don't want you to pray for your son to get saved, or your daughter to get saved, or your mom or daddy to get saved, or your aunt or uncle, your grandmother, grandfather, or the co-worker you work with. He don't want you praying that. So what he's going to do is, is he's going to bind you. He's going to throw something up in your life to cause you to start looking at you instead of praying for the lostness of the person that you love and appreciate so much. I believe you're with me tonight. I really do. Number one, we see the desperate plight of the woman. Number two, we see the, the, uh, another thing there. She was powerless to, to set herself free. She was powerless. She couldn't do it. You remember what I said? We're told in verse 11, she could in no wise lift up herself. She was helpless. You say, well, she's got Jesus in her. Yes, she's got Jesus in her. But, folks, she's not trusting in Jesus. She's not trusting him. She's not looking to the author and the finisher of her faith. She's not looking to the one that saved her soul. She's looking at herself. And she's wanting other people to see her condition. What can you do for me? And then we see another thing. The Bible says she longed to be free. You know why she longed to be free? Can I tell you something? She came to church. She came looking for the answer. Is that why you come? I've told my people before church, why do you come to church? I hope you come because you want to be fed. I hope you come not just to say I went, but you go so that the Lord can do a work in your life and you and the children of God can just come together and worship and magnify the Son of the living God. Why we come? Do we come? Man, I, we, listen, we have people that come in, and I'm telling you folks, I'm just talking about a spirit-led, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent revival because revival is personal. Revival's personal. And revival comes in our heart and in our life when we get real about who we are. You've heard that before. You know that. And how many times through the years in every service, I do Bible studies on Wednesday night, but if I feel led to do an invitation, I'll do one. But I want to tell you on Sunday morning, Sunday night, I do an invitation. Doesn't matter what I preached on, what I said, I do an invitation every time. You know why? Because every time Jesus spoke, he gave an invitation. And I believe you should. You say, well, what if just one person comes? What if nobody comes? Then we'll just keep throwing out the net. But I tell my people, how many times have I given the invitation in this church for you to come bound and broken? And you know you are. And you walk right out that door bound and broken. Knowing you're saved, but the joy is just not there. 
you, 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 you've just let these things take over in your life. And again, I don't want nobody to think this of me. I don't want nobody to look at me wrong. I don't want to ruin my reputation. What reputation? Is your reputation stronger than your relationship with the Lord Jesus? Son, it shouldn't be about reputation. It shouldn't be about what somebody else is saying. It should be about you and holy God meeting at the altar. And when you get up, you're right with him. You've left all those things at his feet. You say, Lord, all these years I've been letting this happen in my life. You say, well, I haven't been letting it. Oh, yeah, you have. You've been letting it happen. I said, you've been letting it happen. You've been letting it happen, and you've been letting it happen, and you've been letting it happen. We've been letting it happen in our lives, folks. This lady, this lady wanted to be set free. I'm asking you tonight with no head motion at all, do you want to be set free? Do you want God to work in you in such a way when you leave this place tonight, you will know you have met with the Lord Jesus? That's what it's about. It's not about me and you not about a choir it's not about a group it's not about the preacher it's not about the staff it's about meeting with the lord jesus i can't do one thing for you but be obedient and preach the book but you must heed the word of god and let god do the rest in you and it is a fact it is the truth she wanted to be free it is true also that if you are gripped by some spiritual infirmity by some sin, you long to be free. You long to be free because Jesus is in you. You don't want that in your life because you know it's not supposed to be there. There's no room for that in your life. You have Jesus in your life. And you're not going to be in, hey, you're not going to be comfortable in that kind of lifestyle. You're not going to be comfortable in, 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 in letting, allowing this to just drive your life day in and day out when he can set you free. And whomsoever the Son sets free, they're free indeed. Amen, preacher. I'll start amen in me. All right, listen. Then we see the deliverance. Then we see the deliverance. We see the deliverance. Oh, man, I want to tell you something. This ham's a bacon up here. Amen? Bacon a little bit. Amen. Oh, me, old Herschel. I remember old Herschel. They say you worry about your weight all the time. Won't you quit eating like you do? <laughs> I didn't say it now, but I, I wanted to tell him, won't you just mind your own business, Herschel? But anyway. <laughs> Oh, listen, the deliverance, delivering power of the Lord. How did deliverance come to this woman? It came from the Lord himself. It came from him. Look at the woman and see what she did and what happened to her. Number one, she fell at his feet. That's, that's where you get your answer. You don't grab hold of it when you go back to your seat. You leave it at his feet. You give it to him. And by the way, if you come down here and you pick it up, just turn around, come back and get it again. I mean, put it back here again. Put it back. Keep doing it till you give it to her. And the Lord will show you what it is to be free. Oh, listen, we're told in verse 12 that when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. That makes all the difference in the world. Can I tell you all something? I hear these people talking about all the time. When I found Jesus, when I found Jesus, when I found Jesus, you didn't find Jesus. Folks, Jesus came looking for you. He found you. He, he found you right where you were. He left the 90 and 9. I was going up the road this morning toward the church. And I won't tell you, I live about three miles from a church. 
And I tell you, man, I was going up through there, and all at once going up through there, man, with my shades on, driving, expecting God to do something just to show up and show out. I want to tell you, I said, Lord, I thank you for leaving the 99 and coming to look for me. Oh, Lord, have mercy. He left the 99, folks, and he came. The Bible says that he came to her so she could come to him. I love that song, He Came to Me. Squire Parsons. He came to me. When I could, could not come to where he was, he came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. So when I could not come, he came. He came to me. The Bible says right here that he came, that, that he called her to him. And the result of that was that she came to him and waited at his feet. What a pathetic and yet what a hopeful sight it, it must have been to see her hobbling across to where he was. Can you see her all bent over? Can you just see her all bent over? Oh, she's just been over and she's trying to get up there to where Jesus is because, you know, Jesus said that he, he called her to himself. And she's been over. She's been this way 18 years. And she's getting closer. And, you know, the closer she gets, she, <laughs> she starts lifting up. Lifting up. And then she just falls down at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus took that which was broke and he fixed it right there. You know, sometimes I want you to hear this. There's people that get saved. Now, I want to tell you something. I believe when you get saved, Jesus changes you. See, I don't believe that Jesus died for a few people. I believe Jesus died for all people. I believe he gave his life for everybody. I don't go with this Calvinistic doctrine. I never have. I never will. If you do, you've got a right to be wrong. Amen? I don't go with it. I do not stand on it. I'm just the opposite. I believe that when Jesus came, born of a virgin Mary, he came to die for all men, not just some men. And I believe that when he saves you, he saves you for all of eternity. I don't believe in, believe in Arminianism. I don't believe you can be saved today and lost tomorrow. If that was the case, man, I'd be saved 575,000 times. How about you? Look at me now. I mean, if you ain't got no teeth, don't smile. But if you do have teeth, just smile at me. Amen? Just <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, listen. But I believe that. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And when Jesus changes you, he sets you free. But do people struggle when they get saved? Yeah, they do. Because I've been saved almost 40 years, and I still struggle. I struggle. You say, well, you're a preacher. You're not supposed to. Folks, I'm a human being. I've got a fleshly nature just like you. Your pastor does. His wife does. I know we're looked at different, but I want you to know, don't let it fool you anymore. We human. We fall short. Somebody told me at our church one time, he walked up to me, and I've had several since, and I'm giving God the glory. They said, one of the things we appreciate so much about you, pastor, is you're transparent. That helps me. Why not be transparent with your people? Son, we fight the same battles you do. But I won't tell you, when I got saved, Jesus changed me. You see, I know I was, I was saved because I got changed. Because if you ain't got changed, you ain't got saved. You still live in that life, and that's all you want. But I want to tell you, that don't mean you're not going to be bound by things. That don't mean you're going to get a little bent over. You take your eyes off Jesus, you'll get that way. I don't care who you are. You'll get that way. And I've watched people through the years, and I know your pastor has. They got saved, man. God changed their life, and they were bent over. And I want to tell you, just gradually begin to see and straighten it up. Whew. You see, that's called a work of grace. Amen. That's called a work of grace. That's what the Lord Jesus does in your life. 
He does what you can do. She couldn't lift herself up, but Jesus can. <laughs> He's coming up. I like old Lazarus, don't you, in the Bible? No, John 11, over there where Martha and Mary thought it was too late. Said, Jesus, you four days late. That song, he's still on time, amen? Hey, listen, no Lazarus, I, I love no Jesus. He started to cry, and he said, take me to where he is. And they went down there, and they rode that stone away. And old Lazarus, he was bound in those grave clothes. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he's done. And every time he took a step, them grave clothes was falling off. You know why? Because he was getting closer and closer to the one that delivered his soul. Hallelujah. I'm a work in progress, man. He's still a working on me, and I sure am glad he is. Aren't you? Amen. Y'all doing good with that? Yes, thing. All right. Hey, listen. Listen now. I don't know what time it is. I, I, I don't even have a watch. Amen. I know how to break one. Listen, she fell at his feet. She heard his word. Here it is, folks. We're told again in verse 12 that Jesus said to her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And when the Savior spoke those words, she knew at once that it was his will to deliver her. She responded, listen, to the word of the Lord Jesus. That made all the difference in her life. I can talk to you all day long, but until you're willing to quit pushing away the Holy Spirit and let His Word sink into your heart and your mind, you're not going to get right in your heart. The Holy Spirit's God, the Lord Jesus, tool on this earth to convict us and to show us where we are with the Lord. And I want to tell you, when he speaks his word, we need to heed that word. <clears throat> and then she felt his touch in verse 13. We are told that he laid his hands on her. And when the Lord lays his hands upon us, we, listen to me, we are set free at once and we are never, ever the same again. Oh, when he touches us, man. Once he touched a leper and the leper was cleansed. Once he touched the deaf man and the deaf man heard. Once he even touched a dead boy and the boy was raised to life. The touch of the master makes all the difference in the world. Oh, listen. She received his deliverance. Verse 13, we're told that he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. This was a miracle, folks. It was a miracle. You see, God wants to do a miracle in you. The greatest of all miracles is when Jesus saved your soul. But he's still in the miracle working business. And he can help you. He can work in your life in such a way that you can go out of here tonight with a closer walk with him. You can go out of here tonight knowing that you've met with him. Knowing that you've met with the master. Isn't that why we come? Isn't that why we want to talk about having revival? Folks, revivals are few and far between now. People are, churches are not having them. I appreciate your pastor wanting to have revival. Son, we need to bring back revivals in our churches. But revival comes when God's people are expecting God to do something in them. In them. And then finally, she glorified God. <laughs> oh, she glorified God. This is what we read in verse 13. You see, a crooked life can never glorify God. Okay. This is what we read in verse 13. See, a crooked life can never glorify God. A life bound by Satan can never glorify God. A sin-bound, self-bound life can never glorify God. But when Jesus gets his way, 
with a man or a woman, then God is glorified. And that's what it's about. It's about when I come to an old-fashioned altar, old-fashioned altar. That's what the altar is. It's, it's a, uh, that's what the altar's for. And we call it old-fashioned altar because people used to use the altar. We still need to use the altar. It's where we meet with him. I tell people all the time, man, you, 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 you want to meet with the Lord and, and, you, and, and, and you want God to do a work in you. But what happens at the invitation? People start grabbing their pocketbook. People start closing their Bibles. Hey, people start looking at each other and say, where do you want to go eat dinner? Or where do you want to go eat supper? Hey, y'all going to the ball game tomorrow night? People start doing that during the invitation. They start looking around to see who else they can find when, when the invitation's over to go to them and talk to them. They're not thinking about people that need Jesus, and they are definitely not thinking about the greatest need there that day, and that's them getting their life right with holy God. We want to leave too quick. We want to get out. Yeah, we're going to come back. But we're going to do the same thing. When the preacher says he closes his Bible, everybody starts grabbing their pocketbooks like they got a million dollars in it. <laughs> they start looking at the grandkids. Get your coat, get your coat, get your coat. They start looking at their husbands. Buck, wake up. It's time to go. My father-in-law, Lloyd Jonas, used to say, before he passed, he'd go to sleep every service on me. I'm not lying. I thought he was praying at one time, but it really wasn't praying. You ain't praying when your mouth. <laughs> he'd always come out, and he'd look at me, and he'd say, Ty, what I heard, it was good. He couldn't have it. He'd fall asleep every time. Amen. But, you know, it's what we do. It's what we do. I just come over here this week, try to be obedient to the Lord. Your pastor so graciously invited me under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and I know I'm here because of that. I don't deserve being here. But if I'm going to come, I want to preach what the Lord's put on my heart. I don't want to have a notebook full of sermons and say, okay, I'm going to preach this. And I want to preach what the Lord tells me to preach. And I believe I did that tonight. You know why I fought this sermon so much? Is because I've already preached it twice today. And I said, man, I don't need to take that sermon over there. That, that was for that group. God said, no, it's for all of them. It's for you again, big boy. That's another thing, Brian, they don't think about. It's why we're preaching. God's preaching at us too. I've hit the altar many a time after I preached a sermon. And I'm asking you tonight, folks, I ain't trying to hold you. I'm just concerned. We're living in some rough days. And we can't be effective in nobody's life if we're not denying ourselves and picking up our cross and following him. God did a work in this woman. You say, oh, but she was, she, she, she was wayward. No, she was saved. She was just bound. No matter how old you are, young you are, middle age, whatever. There's something that's holding you back. There's something that's got a grip on you. And God's wanting to teach you how to get a grip on it. And so tonight, with every head bowed and every eye closed, your pastor's going to be here at the front. In just a moment, we'll grab a song. But I'm asking you tonight before I turn it over to him and ask you to stand. 
I'm, 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 I'm asking you, are you being honest with the Lord? Won't you just stand right where you're at? Right where you're at. And I tell you, why don't you guys just start singing? Whatever you're going to sing, let's go ahead and sing it. Folks, won't you let the Lord have right away in your life? He's here. He's, he has spoken the word tonight through the power of the Holy Spirit. That 